Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar on unifying the design and engineering process for a world of better, faster product development. Today's speaker is our very own CEO, Marcin Tretter. Marcin is a UX designer himself and has a background in psychology. His interests are coding, music, and yerba mate. <laughs> now, without further ado, Marcin, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. What a great and uh, inaccurate intro. <laughs> That's awesome. I do like yoga matter. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is uh, this is awesome. This is a special webinar uh, because I'm actually going to show you some brand new things, some things that we didn't share with anybody yet. Um, so I'm taking a little bit of a risk to show you things that are in alpha and beta uh, phase, but I think it's going to be worth it because I'm going to show you something that's going to change the design and engineering process forever. So Mike already introduced me. I'm the CEO at UXPIN. One thing that I want to emphasize and it's going to be important for this particular webinar is that I'm a coding designer. Um, I've spent years working on this as a designer, but I added coding kind of like a hobby and I still stay on the frontier between design and engineering. And this is going to be important because this frontier is something that we are going to cover today. So we'll start with a, um, a little bit of a um, history of design engineering processes and how is that um, actually influencing today. Um, so we are going to talk about design tools and how they affected the process. Then we are going to switch to code-based design tools. And I'm going to tell you why code-based design tools are the new hope uh, for the design engineering collaboration and the design engineering process. And then just a couple of words about UXPIN Merge, the new upcoming technology that basically imports ReactJS production code to your design editor. And then I'm going to switch to demo. I'm going to, we'll start with the perspective of a designer. So I'm going to show you how code can actually empower designers uh, to build amazing experiences on the web without knowing how to code. And then we are going to switch to the perspective of a developer. So I'm going to show you how developers can empower design process to deliver amazing experiences. And we'll, Put it all together uh, in a unified design and engineering process, and then it will be open for questions. So today, there are going to be some slides, lots of demos, and even some coding. But I really want to emphasize that you don't have to know how to code uh, to participate in this webinar. Um, there are going to be parts that are going to be technical, but I'm going to take that as my challenge uh, to explain everything uh, clearly, and you will get familiar with some of the modern uh, front-end technologies on today's webinar. Okay, let's get started. So design tools were born in the uh, late 70s at Xerox Park. This is where the very first design tool uh, was created. No wonder they also created the very first version of what you see is what you get, a uh, graphic uh, interface for computing. And Mac, um, and Apple copied a bunch of uh, different concepts, including the first design tool and Apple um, um, launched in 1983, uh, Mac Paint, which was the first mass adopted design tool out there. And then it started. We got a lot of tools for a lot of professional use cases. Um, um, Aldous PageMaker later on, Adobe PageMaker, Illustrator, Photoshop, all these tools started in the 80s. Now, what all of them, what they had in common is that the output was an image was either a vector or a raster file, but still an image. And if you look at the uh, breakdown of the most popular tools in the 80s, we had illustration tools, we had desktop publishing tools, the so tools that are supposed to uh, help people working on professional print uh, project, and we had photo editing apps such as Photoshop. Three categories of design tools on the entire market. There was literally nothing else. Of course, there were more tools in those categories. Those, as you can see on the slide, uh, were the main ones. Now, because they were outputting image, they played well for the, the, for the main use case of design work back in the 80s and early 90s, which was print. Majority of the time that designers uh, would spend on uh, were print design projects, posters, leaflets, marketing materials, books, of course, press, you know, like whatever, whatever you, uh, you name it, it was meant for print. And all these tools were very well optimized for print. That was working very well in the 80s, in the early 90s. But then in 1995, approximately 1995, everything changed almost overnight. 
because majority of the work that designers were asked to do all of a sudden was digital. Uh, designers were asked to create digital experiences for the web. Um, but we didn't have dedicated digital designers back then, or there, were, there was few of them. So we had two sources of people who started to work on professional web design. Software engineers who worked on different technologies in the past, but were very familiar with building digital products and print designers. So just two sources of all the people that started to work on the web in the early days. But now the tools that both these groups actually used were those image-based design tools from the 80s. The tools where the output was an image. Why? First of all, there was nothing else. So people were just working with what they had. And of course, print designers were very familiar with the tooling, uh, so they were able to efficiently use uh, them in the process. Uh, but there's another thing and another reason um, they used those tools from the 80s. The reason was that early websites were actually built with images. Uh, so here's an important website. I'm super excited that I found it because I do remember the premiere of Batman Forever, 1995. Uh, it was a big thing out there. I'm sure many of you remember that. And Batman Forever actually got the very first uh, websites devoted to major motion picture. That was the first one. It was created by the team at, um, at Hot Wired, which was the digital division of the Wired magazine. Uh, some of the, of the best designers um, of the 90s and early 2000s worked at, at Wired at that time. And they wanted to create a very special, very rich experience to promote Batman Forever. So um, the website that you can see a couple of screenshots of um, was full of um, interactive experiences. The navigation was built with an advancing iconography. You could download a video, video clips of Batman Forever. And I believe that was the first website that actually offered um, an ability to, uh, to download movies. Uh, you can actually see it on the far left uh, that there was an option of, of QuickTime uh, video and a warning for eight megabytes. Um, so lots of cool experiences. But all of that was created without a single line of CSS because CSS was actually launched later than uh, this website. CSS was launched officially on December 1st, 1995. Now, how did they build those experiences? Here's a quote of Alec uh, Pollack, one of the designers who worked on this website. And the key is literally on, on the image map part of the, um, of the quote. So they were using images export, exported from those image-based design tools that were origins and reach out to the 80s. And then they put it image map region in HTML to map those images and link them together. That was the entire magic. Early websites were images. They were images. So those tools that were outputting image were absolutely necessary in order to create a website. And this process actually lasted for many years until perhaps 2008, 2009, when CSS3 was, was getting really much sure and the CSS spec was uh, uh, regularly updated with features that were killing the images in the design process. Until then, image was always present in the web design process. So here's a typical thing that people uh, used to do. Designer would be trusted with painting the UI in one of those illustration tools. And the file would go to an engineer who would extract layers that were needed in order to complete the interface. You know, in the early days, that was the entire interface was an image. Later on, we still used images for things like um, radius on, on the corners of boxes, shadows, everything that was not available in CSS. And the majority of those things actually appeared in CSS version three. Uh, we were using images to kind of like hack through this experience. So developers were extracting layers, then they were coding the experience, and then the back and forth started because we were always comparing the image with the real uh, thing produced uh, in the product development process. And they were never identical. So there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of compromises uh, that were necessary in order to complete the project. And once everyone was terribly tired of this entire process, some sort of a compromise was being launched. And that process started in the early 90s, in the uh, very first days of the web, and continued for many, many years. So images were an important part of that. And they introduced a lot of problems, two categories of problems. First, output problems. So if you think about using any images on the web, 
they create the most inaccessible experience possible uh, because those images are not um, um, compatible with any screen readers. So you're just blocking people uh, with, that need screen readers to experience any digital experiences from actually experiencing the web. And that was a case, and that was a big problem of the early web, and then continued for some time after as well. Now, images also weighed quite a lot as, as files. So they were making web completely slow. <laughs> really, it was slow, slower. Your website was that slow. No wonder all this um, early warnings about the size of the website, size of video, size of assets, right? It was needed because all, all the web was really heavy. And then interactivity was limited because there's, there are only a few things that you can do with image map regions. Um, and that was limiting the web. But even uh, worse though, there were process problems that actually survived surprisingly well all these decades that passed. So designer was actually pushed into the role of a painter that supposed to deliver the image, the accurate image of the experience, which is absurd on its own image of experience, uh, that then supposed to be passed to developer. And even though development world made an amazing progress on the process end with agile uh, methodologies, um, even though at times they invited designers, of course, through the process, because of the nature of the tooling used by designers, because of the nature of the role of a designer in the process, we were still pushing to a waterfall process. And whenever you hear stories about hybrid of waterfall and agile, it typically starts with designers uh, being tasked with delivery of the finished interface before the development starts, right? No wonder because uh, the output of a designer work is a static image or is a semi-interactive image with some sort of links um, all over it. So with all of that, you get those misunderstandings because of the siloed process. You have engineers, you have designers, they use different, completely different language, they use completely different assets. Um, there is lack of compatibility, Don't, so no wonder there's just back and forth that you could see on the chart when people just try to uh, build a common understanding and achieve some sort of a compromise. And with that, the quality is always lower than expected because whatever a designer would draw in you know, one of those image tools will never look the same on the web. The speed of the process is slow because there's back and forth between design and engineering. And the consistency is just terrible because it's hard to maintain um, any sort of a system when you have on one end, on the design end, you have a bunch of images and on the code end, you have code. That's just, you know, like naturally, uh, uh, inconsistent on its own. So we were going with this process for a while. CSS was fortunately maturing. Um, this is kind of an interesting joke. CSS is awesome. And it goes back to the, to the years when box model and CSS was still kind of broken. It's so much better today. Uh, CSS was making a lot of progress, a lot of progress. And after CSS3 really matured, images just disappeared from the process all of a sudden. Nobody's using any kind of backgrounds, uh, semi-transparent backgrounds to create uh, radial corners of boxes. Nobody's putting uh, PNGs as shadows. Nobody's using any images to create the interface on its own, right? It's just unnecessary because you would create everything during the development in HTML, CSS. And if you need interactions, you would just add JavaScript, of course, right? So web technologies made an amazing progress and they actually gave us freedom of the di dictatorships of, of, of images. We don't need them anymore. Look around the web, the only images that you're going to see are photographs, illustrations, and icons. That's it. The text is not an image, finally. Um, completely contrary to how uh, Batman Forever was created back in the 90s. Um, all the effects are not images. You just don't need that, right? which is amazing. And that's the progress of the web. It like made web more accessible, made web way faster and easier to build as well and maintain at scale, right? So it's an important thing, this development of, of web technologies. So modern websites are not images, but the process didn't change that much. And that's the absurd thing that I really want you to remember. So today, in many, many companies, the process is going to look roughly like that. There's still the painting UI face of the process. And there's an image file a designer sends, maybe not over email anymore, maybe on, not on an FTP server anymore, but with some sort of a tool and delivers, the designer would deliver this image to development. 
And either with the aid of the tool that they use, like Zeppelin, say, um, or anything else, they will tr try to translate those images into code. In fact, it's not that much different than the process in the early 90s. Instead of extraction of layers from a design tool, you, you have to engage as a developer in the process of translation images into code. So there's still back and forth, of course, because designers continue to work with images and developers continue to work with code, and those are naturally not compatible. So design tools, it seems, didn't get the message that web technologies changed, and there are, there's an opportunity to work with a much more efficient process than ever before. They didn't get the message that we can now forget the 80s for anything but icons, illustrations, and optimization of photographs. We don't need those images anymore, but they just ignore it. So if you look at, around the market today, you'll still see a lot of image-based tools, which are way better than the tools in the 80s, don't get me wrong. Those are some amazing illustration tools, and they represent a lot of progress for illustrations. But when it comes to um, interactive design, there's not much of a change because we are still forced to work with images. And because of that, designers are still considered painters. And the process is pushing designers towards being a painter of the interface, towards creating the static representation, the complete representation of the interface in a static image, which is terrible. And still, we are, we are battling those processual uh, problems. The process is still sequential because we are tasked with delivering a static image and passing it to development. There's a handoff process. A like handoff on its own tells you where the problem is. If it, there's a handoff, there, this is not an agile methodology at all. This is still waterfall. And there are still silos, um, um, one with engineers, one with designers, because they use completely different assets. We do use completely different assets. And we still fight with low quality, low speed, and low consistency. So despite the amazing progress of web technologies, especially over the past 10 years, we didn't make this kind of progress on the market of design tools. So image-based design tools, those tools that started in the 80s, which are great for illustration, I really want to emphasize that. If you want to draw an icon, you, will want you won't find any better tools than that, are limiting the progress of digital experiences out there because they are just stuck in the, world, in the old process, in the old world. So here's a new category. Right, the new hope, code-based design tools. Tools that render designers intent in code. And we are going to really emphasize that a couple of times, but you don't need to know how to code to use code-based design tools. It's not about that. Code-based design tools are all about equalizing the field for both designers and engineers. Code-based design, design tools basically let you work within the same constraints and with the same powers as engineers. In, in a tool that feels still familiar to you. It's just a different, completely different paradigm. So if you compare design tools that are image-based with code-based design tools side by side, there's a couple of things to pay attention to. So first of all, fidelity. Um, when you're working with vectors, it's beautiful. Crisp images. Images, that's the key word. The key word. Now, in code-based design tool, you get the realism. Because code-based design tools typically use a um, browser rendering engine to render designer's intent. And it's typically the browser that you use as a user to actually see the design, right? So if you use Safari, you'll use the rendering engine from Safari. If you use Chrome, you'll see the rendering engine of Chrome, and so on. Uh, so you get the true experience before you invest money into development. So you can test things. You can see how they're going to look like after development. Now, another thing is interactivity. And image-based design tools did make a lot of progress when it comes to interactivity. You know, Photoshop was completely passive. There was no need for, of course, for any interactivity for Photoshop. Today's design tools introduce hotspot um, uh, interactions. Uh, they try to animate between static images. So there's some progress, but it's nowhere close to the realism of, of true interactions. Now, code-based design tools bring this interactivity because Code-based design tools use the power of JavaScript underneath. You don't have to see it. You don't have to write JavaScript, but it's there. And thanks to that, you get access to the exact same powers that developers have access to. Still, so, from graphic interface, so you don't need to know how to code. Just get this power. So you can use things like conditional interactions, regular expressions. You have real HTML elements, such as inputs, checkboxes, 
radio buttons. Uh, you have space of all the elements, right? So you can create those realistic experiences. Thanks to all of that, you are actually in the world of development. You are building the bridge um, between designers and engineering. Or sometimes, you know, like I like to say, there's no need for a bridge because it's the same universe, right? There's nothing to bridge. Um, Image-based design tools are nowhere close to this kind of um, reality. And true design systems. And that's something that I'm going to show you today. Design systems that have single source of truth. So there's no like a special place on the Dropbox for all the images from the design tool. And then there's, of course, GitHub repository with code. There's just one source of truth. So we are going to go through that as well. Now, when we started UXPIN, we decided to, that our mission is going to be to merge design and engineering into one process. This is what we started with. And we knew that we cannot just create another image-based design tool. We cannot create a tool that outputs vectors or raster images because that's going to always stay in this disconnected universe. So we knew that we have to build the tool on the new paradigm, on the code-based paradigm. We have to build a tool that uses the web technologies to empower designers to create amazing experiences and connect to engineering. But as a goal, and still goal today, is to actually not force designers to code, just empower them to use the power of code to create advanced, realistic experiences. So on the webinar last week, um, I showed you some of the super advanced patterns that you can build in minutes in your experience, such as this uh, password uh, components that you can see on the left, where you have a real input. You won't have that in image-based design tool. When you have validation of the content, you won't have that in image-based design tools. State of elements, you can make the passwords covered or uncovered. Um, you get the real thing, right? And it was all done without a single line of just typed JavaScript, right? It's all from the, um, um, done with the UXP interface. And even if you stop there, designer is not a painter anymore. Designer actually works with the code even though the designer don't code, right? It, you explain codes for you. Now, the process doesn't need to be sequential waterfall process anymore. You can work simultaneously with developers because you don't have to wait for the entire handoff to, com co to complete because you are working with the real thing. So there's less back and forth, right? And with that, there's less misunderstanding uh, misunderstandings between designers and engineers. If you design something in UX spin, uh, it's going to look exactly the same after production because it's the same rendering engine. So you have more time to focus on the quality. The speed of the process is faster. But consistency is still troublesome. And it's troublesome for anyone on the market, right? It's not only us. The problem is that even if you just use the UX that we have today, you can create those amazing interactive comp components. You can save them in a shared library. You can uh, save this library as a design system. You can do all of that. It's more than anybody else offer. But still, there are two sources of truth. One would be in UXPIN, one would be in code. So we decided to do something about it. We decided to change it. The first experiments with uh, that change happened almost three years ago, I believe. One of our engineers started to work on the integration of web components with UXPIN. So the universal standard for shared reusable components that, um, um, that some people are trying to push uh, to the world of development. Um, it's supposed to be the browser standard. It's going there, but it's going there slowly, right? But we've done some first experiments. We rendered web components inside of UXPIN. And then we got hooked on that, you know, because we noticed that, well, you can actually connect to the, in theory, to the repository of code and render the production code inside of UXPIN. And we started to think about what kind of process that's going to create. I pushed it really far and then we called it merged to really get back to our mission statement of merging design and engineering. And the merge today brings coded components to a design tool, to UXPIN editor. And the process with that approach looks dramatically different than the two charts I showed you previously. So the process actually starts with one source of truth, with the coded design system. And this coded design system is connected to the design tool where designers can plan UI with the real thing, with real components. And then when engineers join, they actually use the same coded design system to implement the UI in the production version. It's the same, they're using the same assets, right? So they automatically, designers and engineers in that approach, speak the same language. So there's minimum of misunderstandings. And then 
I go to launch the thing, right? And whatever we learn through the process is going back to the design system and re refuels the entire process. So it's quite, quite a different path, way shorter, way, way, le way less complex uh, than the old process that I showed you. Okay, the one truth to, for designers and engineers. Let me show you that. I think that's enough of slides for now. You wanna see the real thing, right? Okay, so we'll start with the perspective of, of designers. Right, so for now, we are not actually going to see any code. We're just going to see UXPIN interface. Now, it looks like the UXPIN that you have, it looks like our desktop app. It is our desktop app, but in fact, this is, this is an alpha version of Merge, right? So this is a separate, you can actually see it on my computer, but this is not a normal desktop version of UXPIN. So with Merge, there's a couple of special things here. So the components that you see here, which look like components from your design system library built in UXPIN, we're actually not building UXPIN at all. Those are components that are synchronized with a code repository. We'll start with um, Atlassian uh, design system, open source design system called, called Atlaskit. It is one of the best, the most advanced design systems out there built with ReactJS. Now, as a designer, I just go into UXPIN and I get access to the components that are synchronized with the design tool. We'll start with something very, let me just move around the um, controls of Zoom. You don't see it, but I see it on my screen. It's covering part of UXPIN interface. Okay, we're good to go. So we'll start with a very simple component, a button. This button has a bunch of options here that you can see. This is a local standard. All of those um, uh, properties that you can edit here are coded into this component. So inside of the organization, you can decide how to name things, how they're going to appear inside of UX pin, and those are the same properties that engineer would use to implement this very component. Now, one useful thing uh, that Atlassian has is shifted container that makes, us, makes this button resizable in an easy way. Okay, so we have a button, right? Um, now, let's say I want to change the color. There's a predefined, in this component, set of appearances, which are, you could say, legal inside of Atlas Kit. So if you wanna set a danger um, button, you know, <laughs> connected to some sort of an error, you just choose appearance danger. If you wanna go with a more subtle experience, you have that option as well. This is all coded into this component. So you could say that this is this local standard of how design is supposed to work, which means, that designer is not going to accidentally create another shade of blue over here and confuse developer. It also means that designer cannot just, you know, like that um, suggest another version of this component unless this is, uh, this is actually um, allowed inside of this design system. In terms of Atlas Kit, it's not allowed because it could be, you know, like um, in, instead of appearance, we could code color option that just passes um, any hex definition, just like a normal component. But Atlas Kit decides to limit the choice to those options. Okay, so we have a button. That's pretty straightforward. But the magic happens when you actually preview it. So we'll launch UXPIN preview, which can be shared with developers um, or stakeholders or anybody you want. And you can see out of the box that the interactions are there. We didn't add those effects. They are just coded into this component. And we can actually move it quite far because UXPIN connects to the uh, so-called events that are um, triggered by act user actions within this component and allows designers without coding to connect to those events. Uh, so we'll do something, uh, something very simple. Uh, as you can see, you can mix and match coded components coming from this repository of code with anything else in UXPIN you can match it. It's going to be visible on the spec mode, which one is which, uh, but you can basically match it easily on one, on one piece of canvas. Now, if you wanna just make this box disappear, you can connect uh, to this event on click on this button and just simply select toggle. We can select an animation if you want to, you can preview this, how it's going to work. As you can see, we are actually building JavaScript, but you don't see it. You don't have to see it. It's all served through UXPIN interface. So now we have this toggle interaction available over here. So launch preview again, uh, you're going to see something quite amazing. So now 
when you click on the button, the box disappears. So you could say you programmed the interface, but in a way UX can do it for you. UX can connect it to the repository of code, pull those uh, components to uh, our editor, and then let you set up all those interactions yet like you normally do. And by the way, this is production code. This is not some, some, some sort of a special coded version just for UX pin. Not at all. This is production code integrated with UX pin. Okay, now you can do things that are way more advanced than that. Um, let's take a look at this component with avatars. Uh, so that's one, uh, that one is really interesting. It shows a couple of interesting things over here. So first of all, there's a max count property. So in Atlas case, you can decide how many avatars you want to show uh, maximum, right? So right now it's set up for two, so you just, see the, uh, you just uh, can see the two circles over here. Cool, make it up to three. You see that there's one, uh, two that were hidden, right? Now, the way to add avatars through this kind of object. So it is code, uh, it's a JSON structure of an object. This is how Atlas Kit is built, right? But in fact, you know, like it's, it's pretty cool for designers to be exposed uh, to this kind of pieces of code here and there so they can get familiar. It's not, I mean, like it, you can read it in English. It's not like a very difficult convention. I'm sure you would agree. So we'll add a couple of, uh, of avatars over here. We'll just um, try to change those images so we can recognize them. Um, okay, I think that's it. All right, cool. So now we see four of them, four circles. And we can still modify this number, right? So five circles all cool. You can actually modify it automatically. So that's pretty cool because now, you know, like all those micro decisions during the design process are actually possible uh, uh, to be made during the design process. Uh, you pro you're probably familiar, sadly, <laughs> all of us, we are familiar with situations where uh, the design that we planned uh, gets back to us with developers asking me like, uh, what if there's going to be six avatars? What do you want me to do? You want to hide them? You want to show them? Uh, do you want to have a scroll? Uh, do you want to make them smaller, right? Those decisions now can be made inside of the tool. And outside of this, of this merge technology, outside of UX, it's pretty much impossible. Okay. Uh, we'll get back to these interactions because there's another thing that I wanted to show you. So with those uh, interactions on click, we can also modify other coded components. Uh, so we'll just do something simple. On click, let's say that we want to change the number of visible um, avatars. So we'll do set property. That's the element. You can use those, this trigger in UX spin. And max count will switch us to six. Okay, cool. Now we want to refresh uh, the preview. Um, you know that this is not how it works on UX in the production version, but on, on this alpha, we have, we have to refresh. All right, and now on click, you get those six, um, uh, those five faces visible inside of UX pin. So there you go. You actually, you're, you're building, you're really building the interface. You're building it with real pieces of code, the same ones that are used for engineer, uh, for, by engineers, but you're actually doing that inside of your design editor. And um, those examples are quite simple but they show you how quickly you can craft experiences when you have access to production code. And by the way, um, I'm, I'm never tired of emphasizing that this is not the kind of feature that you can expect to have in any image-based design tool because you need to actually engage browser rendering engine to render code. Um, and some people, some brave people with amazing imagination try to do it in Sketch and you just can't do it. Uh, you can't do it on this level of details and interactions, it's absolutely impossible. Um, but when you're a code-based design tool, such as UX pin, those things are possible. Okay, so this is not the only um, uh, thing that you can do with those components uh, because you can also quickly use components that are absolute, absolutely um, impossible to build in any image-based design tool. And a good example, of course, is a date picker um, because we all need to design them. Every single designer at one point in, in their life have to design a date picker but date pickers are extremely complex because of the richness of data that they of course uh, present. And with that, nobody can build an interactive version and test it with users, which is terrible of course. But when you engage a coded version of a component, like this one coming from Atlassian, 
you can do it. You can have a fully functional date picker in no time um, available to you uh, inside of the design tool. So you can test it with users, you can see how they react without building the, the full product, right? So you just have access to this component. Okay, so let me show you another component. We'll switch design systems, we'll switch from Atlassian um, Atlas Kits to Mineral UI from CA Technologies. Uh, one of our, of our customers, an amazing design system, um, um, a very rich design system with a lot of uh, B2B components um, that are missing from any, many other design systems, like a table. Okay, so let me show you a table. So tables are extremely hard to design in any image-based design tools because it's hard to have a table that's going to react to data. But when you're using coded components as a designer, um, it's basically built in. So for example, let's add another row. You can see it's JSON again. I mean, like, this is just such a popular pattern among developers. It should change its content so we can see it. And boom, you have another row in a table. Right, and you can do things like height header and high contrast. That's a pretty cool thing that they've built in. And if you are um, unhappy with the amount of space in the rows, uh, they coded the most more spacious version of that as well. Bunch of options that are just available to you inside of this component. So imagine an organization uh, like CA, like they already have access to that, so we don't even have to imagine. You can ask them, but you know, like designers have access to those coded components and they can use them inside of their process, during their process. Um, they don't have to manually redraw every single time this table, they don't have to go through all these uh, tedious tasks. They just get access to it. Uh, it's quite amazing. And things like tabs, that's another nice component. And if we'll view it over here, you can see it actually, it does work. Right? And we didn't set up any interactions. And you can edit all this content, you can add more tabs, uh, you can change the style within the constraints that they set up for you in the design system. Uh, so you get, as a designer, you get all of that out of the box. Uh, so you don't have to know how to code, you just have to use this technology uh, to connect to a repository of coded components. And now an interesting thing that sometimes designers are not aware of is that it's not only for companies with robust open source design systems. If your organization um, is using a modern approach to JavaScript, it's quite probable that the code is already modular. So buttons are in separate files, tables are in separate files, not like one spaghetti code, right? And it's highly probable that they use ReactJS and Merge technology works with ReactJS right now and only with ReactJS. In the future, we are likely going to expand it, but ReactJS really covers majority of the market right now. And even if it's not called the design system, it's highly likely that your engineers have those collections of components in the repository that you could just use in the design process. But if you are stuck with image-based design tools, you just can't do it, right? You can't connect to this source of truth. You can't have one source of truth. With Merge, you get this access, and you don't have to know how to code, right? Um, and in the last, last example, then we'll switch to the perspective of a developer. You can even do things like videos. That's, uh, by the way, that's the design system from Pinterest, Pinterest Gestalt. I showed on the last webinar, and you can basically play video inside of your design tool. Uh, playing, okay, that's nice. You're playing an HD video instead of a design tool, so you can use it for video backgrounds and whatnot. Um, so anything that's possible in code, all of a sudden it's possible inside of a design tool. Um, so that's the magic of Merge for designers. No coding required, but all the powers of code are available to you uh, inside of the design editor. Okay, now uh, let's switch to the developer perspective. And we'll start with something that, um, um, our team just finished today, so it's on a staging server. Um, and I didn't show that to anybody yet, so you're going to be first. I'm a little bit nervous, and so I'm hoping everything is going to work out very well. I'm pretty sure it will. We have an amazing engineering team. Um, so this is our staging server, and we'll just um, build a quick, quick card, or we'll just drag and drop this card from the Mineral UI design system. And 
let's say that, that we are engineers and we are working with the design team that uses Merge um, to build uh, some sort of a card interface. And then we are getting this link because that can be shared um, directly to a developer. A developer doesn't even need to sign in. And then we are inspecting uh, this design. I mean, it's a simple one, it's just a card. <laughs> and the thing that Merge provides is actually the Compose JSX code. So developers see the representation of all these components and all the properties of those components over here, and they can just copy paste it to their code. Basically, it's a return statement uh, from the function or a class that is responsible for this particular piece of, of interface. So UXPIN delivers the information that engineers really need to implement this design, that designers planned. And again, designers and engineers are using the same components, which is quite magical. Um, so this is just on the staging server, but for those of you who are in the private alpha of UX Merge, you will see that um, on your account um, in a couple of days. We just need to complete all the tests. As you can see, it actually works very well. It shows you the Compose, JSX, the actual true representation of this piece of design in the actual code that is reusable by engineers. Okay, cool. Now we'll make those things a little bit more hardcore. So I'm going to show you my code. <laughs> it's a little bit scary for any coding designer. I want to show you um, kind of a boilerplate repository that I built for UXP Merge, uh, so people have an easy start uh, with the technology. And with that, I'm going to explain how Merge works, and then we'll launch a development server so you can see this code being actually used um, in real time. Okay, so we'll start with my code editor. This is VS Code, um, and this is a repository with a bunch of components. Um, and it's just, you know, we can inspect that. So you can see it's just normal React.js code. Uh, so we are returning a styled component from Emotion. I'm just, I just use uh, Emotion as, a, as, as the basis for CSS. And with that, uh, to engineers on the call, I can, I, I can assure you that Merge basically works with any approach to CSS. And I will explain why in a second. But it doesn't matter if you use SAS-less, uh, Stylus as a preprocessor, if you use styled components, glamorous, emotion, whatever you want, really. Pure CSS, of course, as well. Um, so in that case, I'm using emotion, I'm rendering this button, and there are properties. And those properties are actually used inside of UX in interface to make, to make those design decisions available to designers, right? So this is you know, like why you will see uh, the dev server. You can change the style of this button, of this button that, uh, that we have here. Uh, to primary, secondary success, and it's connected to the styles that uh, are coded into this component, right? So we'll render that in a second, uh, but before we'll get there, I want to explain how uh, Merge works. So we have to take a look at package.json. Package.json shows you all sorts of uh, dependencies that a project, a coded project needs to run. It's a classic approach uh, to any JavaScript development in this day and age. You have to install a bunch of dependencies uh, to make the project run the way you intend it to. Uh, now, inside of the package JSON, there's a part responsible for scripts. So you can basically run certain commands, certain scripts, um, automatically from the command line. And the one script that we are going to focus on is over here. So uh, when you use the start command uh, for this repository of code, you will actually engage a tool called UXPIN Merge. And UXP Merge, of course, is a dependency on this project. You can see it here. UXP Merge, command line. Uh, and with that, there's a couple of things that are, um, that are happening. And this is the hardest thing of this webinar, so, <laughs> so bear with me. So when you launch UXP Merge, Merge is looking for Webpack config. And once Webpack is a tool for bundling the code, um, so you prepare the code from the development environment for the browser. That's basically what you need to remember. It makes the, the code ready for the browser. Now, we are looking, UXP Merge is looking for this Webpack config, and then UXP Merge is running the bundle from the Webpack config. So it's bundling the code the way you plan it, and then uh, might or might not engage a wrapper. Uh, that's an optional thing. If you want to pass special themes to components and whatnot, use a wrapper. And then Merge is sending this package of code to a special server. This is our dev server um, that we are using for Merge. So basically, 
Um, the way Merge treats code is exactly identical with the way you treat the code when you want to deploy it, right? So UXP Merge sees your code the same way the browser would see it. So we'll get to, uh, to the process in a second, uh, just so you know uh, when you will have a chance to configure your own um, Merge integration. The only other thing that you need is um, a config, which tells you where the components are and which components you want to import to your XPIN. And that's it. So nothing is coded in a very special way, it's just production code, this little config, and this command that basically tells Merge how to package everything together and how to send it to the browser. Uh, for those of you who like to dive deep into things, here's the Webpack config, so just so you, you can see that nothing special is happening there. In that case, like this is the main thing has, that is happening. So it's just Babel loader for, for JavaScript, um, which just lets me use the, the modern version of, of, of JavaScript in code. So that's pretty much it. So there's no magic. So even, I mean, like, even if you are a non-coding designer on the call right now, you're looking at that and you're thinking, I don't know what the hell is going on here. I want you to remember that we don't require any special approach to coding and it's going to work perfectly in UXPIN. And that's the kind of message that you want to carry to your engineers if you don't code yourself. Okay, so now we'll take this code and launch it in a dev version of UXP Merge. So let me move again the zoom control so I can find my terminal. Perfect, we are in the right directory. So as you remember from the package, Jason, the only thing that we need to do is basically use the, com the command npm start. Okay which as you can see runs this script so it's engaging UXP merge with the webpack config with the wrapper and it's packaging the whole code sending it to the dev server so we can browse it takes a couple of, of, of seconds because we are compiling all this code and then automatically the code is being launched inside of the browser and there we go this is the dev version this is the experiment mode for UXP, UXP merge and now this is um, we, we, we took a quick look on the, for the, on the code of uh, button. Here's this button. Uh, it's available to us. It's just production code rendered in, in Merge. Now, uh, as you might remember, in, in properties and prop types, uh, for this particular component, we had choice of a couple of styles. You see it here. We can switch between different styles. And we can switch sizes. I added a couple of modes for buttons. And we can even do things like we can delete this icon, for example. Okay, and we have our buttons fully functional. It is interactive, the launch preview. You can see that all the interactions work out of the box because UXP is basically running this production code and to really emphasize how it's going to work in the future. Uh, so this is the dev version. So when developers integrating a repository with UXP Merge, they would probably like to engage that just to test those components. It does, like designer doesn't need to run it. Designer will get access to those components from the library. So the experience that we described with Atlas Kit components and, and Mineral UI components, like that's the design experience. This is for people who code. So they can test components, they can plan those properties, um, um, over here and they can get the result that they want. Now, uh, there's some interesting thing that we will do right now. So let's say that all of a sudden inside of our organization, we want to change radius of all the corners and we want to make it more prominent because now we like rounded things. You know, in the old process, that would be just panic, you know, like designers updating sketch files um, all over the place and then saying to developers, developers checking those radiuses, probably there's some mistakes in rendering and you know, it would take us a week. Now I will show you how to uh, change it in Merge. So uh, in my case, I'm using um, abstraction for styles. Uh, so I'm using um, um, JSONs that represent the, the key value. And I'm going to change this radius that over here to 30 pixels, okay? So it's going to be very well visible. So. I saved it and you can see that Merge is actually tracking those changes and it's recompiling the code automatically. And one should be done in a second. Okay, and now Merge is telling me, okay, compiled successfully, refresh the browser. 
Okay, I'm going to refresh the browser. And now we have 30 pixels radius on the button. Full drag and drop a new button. It has the same styles. I don't have to update any files, any images, uh, nothing like that. And it automatically would affect production code and the components used by designer, right? So it's a, it's a design decision that actually carries to both universes because we have this one source of truth. Um, and things can get even cooler. So let me show you two other things in this dev environment. So this is the table uh, that I built for this um, boilerplate repository. A bunch of data. Uh, we'll add another header. So let's say banjo. There's no banjo in either of those bands, but let's put banjo. Okay, so nobody plays banjo in any of those bands. Uh, but if we'll browse this component, we'll see it in the, in the preview you can actually see that the sorting works, right? So automatically, we added a new category, doesn't matter, because uh, this is a nice decoded component. Okay, cool, so we can sort that. And uh, another thing that's absolutely impossible to, to create uh, in any image-based design tool uh, are charts. So uh, those charts are actually implementation of the library called React VIS, React VIS, uh, created by Uber. Uh, team and they created those charts uh, to serve um, their internal cases of, of building dashboards for Uber, as far as I know. Now, I just implemented those charts into Merge, and you can see that they work with the full functionality. So you can update the data, for example. All right, so now um, this is over 50%. You can modify the way it looks. Then make it super thick. And now if we'll browse it in preview, you can see that the hint is automatically updated as well. So there you go. You get a full chart experience. And not only pie charts, of course, uh, I think that one was really cool. Area chart. I like that one because you can actually modify the curve. So we'll go with curve like that, right? And designer, can just automatically make all those design decisions and get the real interactive thing because it's coming straight from code. So this is how Merge works. So Merge gives you access to those, this production code, to real components, and make designers um, access the power of web technologies and one source of truth um, shared with engineering without actually requesting any knowledge of how to code. And at the same time, developers get control over the visual properties of those components and they can plan which things can be changed and which cannot be changed and they can rest assured that everything um, after the implementation is going to be an exact match so they will be never surprised <laughs> surprised by some um, you know, some crazy new implementation of this chart uh, unless this is a very conscious decision so there's less um, uh, probability of, of mistakes is significantly significantly lower okay let me get back to slides uh, for just a second because we are almost out of time. So um, a question you know, like that I hear a lot is like, what about the new components? What about components that are not in the repository just yet? And the thing is uh, that you can plan components exactly like you used to um, and before merge. So you draw it, uh, preferably in a code-based design tool such as UXPIN, and then the component would get coded and then with code, the component will just land in the same, uh, the very same design system and refuel the um, um, uh, library of components in UXPIN. So another uh, highly technical thing uh, that non-coding uh, people on the call don't really need to uh, know that much about, but for uh, you, all of you uh, engineers on the call, that might be a very useful piece of knowledge. So the way with the full launch this is going to work is basically that uh, UXPIN is going to actually connect to the continuous integration server. Travis, Circle CI, doesn't really matter. It's just going to be a single line of code with a special token that you will generate on your UXPIN account. And from that moment in time, UXPIN will automatically sync with the repository whenever you are, well, it depends on what you want to do. You could do it on commit, you could do it on merge, you know, like whatever you want. Uh, but it means that you will just do it once and coded components in UXPIN available to the design team 
are always going to be up to date. So nobody needs to run a separate process. Okay, another thing is like, what about the export of code? What about situations when a designer wants to generate uh, the code um, and just uh, skip development? So UX bin is not a um, code builder. It's not a Dreamweaver kind of solution. Um, and the reason is, that we believe in long-term maintainability of digital products. <laughs> UX Bin is mainly serving uh, uh, product design and product development, not marketing teams, uh, which means that whatever is being created with UX Bin is meant to last um, and it's not disposable. And with that, we, wanna, um, uh, we want teams that are using UX Bin to comply with the local code conventions. If we would start generating code, which is totally possible, of course, we could, uh, but then, this code is never going to comply with local conventions and hence it's going to be hard to maintain long term. It's going just to add work and problems to the process. And as you might remember, our mission is to connect design, to merge design and engineering into one process. But as I showed you on this test server, um, we are actually uh, showing or giving access um, uh, to the composed JSX. So developers actually get um, design decisions in the format that they can just copy paste and implement within their code. And that uh, this JSX is basically uh, coming from coded components in the first place. So it's already, it already complies with the local conventions um, uh, in a given, in a given com company. Uh, so this is like, I, I firmly believe that this is the best approach to, uh, to make development work really fast with the design tool. Okay. So, Probably plenty of you have a question, how can I get started? I mentioned that we are, we are at the end of private alpha, we are almost in, in beta. But in fact, there's a way for you to start um, um, your adventure with Merge very, very soon. Um, and I'll tell you how in a second, but first, a um, couple of uh, restrictions. So, so first of all, um, you, have to, uh, you have to have components in React JS. okay? So that's something that you wanna uh, remember. Um, and that's, you know, like that's basically the biggest um, restriction of on using Merge right now. Um, if you don't use Webpack, don't worry about it. Uh, I can, uh, the team can help you write um, uh, your first Webpack config in no time and you can just use it um, as an additional bundle process. We've done that with some companies as well. Um, uh, CSS, uh, the approach to CSS doesn't matter, so you can start using it uh, with whatever you have. Um, it's probably going to be easier if you can code um, uh, to, to start with Merge Alpha once we are in beta and in full launch in the um, very early uh, 2019, then anybody can use it, of course. But right now in Alpha, it's better to code because the access to Alpha involves this development environment that I showed you, when you can actually take your local code on your computer and render it in UX bin. Okay, so how can you get started? Um, save this email, merge at uxpin.com and, 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 and just email me <laughs> and our team working on merge and, um, don't share it on social media. Uh, don't announce it. Um, uh, we'll just keep it to the people who watch this webinar, uh, for now. Um, so you can, if you apply today, you'll probably get access very soon. Um, we'll treat people uh, that attended this webinar, uh, in a very special way. And also because it's going to be easier for you to integrate your code with Merge because you already saw how I did it. So you have some foundation. So it's going to be a smooth start. Okay, with that, I want to thank you and I'm looking forward to hear your questions. All right, thank you, Marcin. Uh, sure. First question for you is, it looks like you can pull in components and make some changes to it and or enhance it. Can you create a new component, add new interactions, animations, et cetera, and share that with the dev team? Can they see the code created in UX Pin as part of that component? <clears throat> so, um, exactly. So, so this, is, this is a great question. So, components, so we don't export the code that developers can just implement, right? But developers in UX, uh, uh, in teams that use UX Pin, they can actually see the true CSS um, uh, that was used to style the element. They can, uh, they can see all the interactions that you planned in UX Pin. But then you, they have to still code it and synchronize it with the shared source of truth. And then it will land back to UX Pin as a component, as a React.js component. So this is kind of the process. You, know, you plan it as you, like you used to, and then it's coded, 
and resync back to UXPIN. Um, unless you code, then you can take a shortcut and you can just write a new component and just add it to, to merge as well. Great, thank you. Uh, we're over time, so I will ask you one more. Does the developer get everything from the generated file, for example, the video file, image file, CSS, React.js, fonts, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, so this, is, you know, this is already working production piece of code. So if, for example, uh, this video player would use some custom font, um, that would be already in code. So the developer already has it in the first place. But then when it comes to properties, like for example, let's say that this, uh, this video player I showed you from Pinterest, actually takes an, an URL to an MP4 video. So any MP4 video um, that you can find, you can play within this player. It's a pretty cool component from Pinterest. Um, developer, once designer plans everything, I mean, like uh, hidden controls, a loop, um, a different link, link to a different video, developer is actually going to see this composed piece of code with references to all these properties. So the only thing left for the developer is actually to copy, copy that and place it within a return of the, of the function in React.js piece of code, or if uh, they're using, I don't want to get to technical, but if they're using components based on classes, then they would just put it into a render function and then return of the render function. So they will get the exactly same effect um, um, as they can see in UXPIN in real code, just by copying this piece of code generated by UXPIN. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Great, thanks so much, Marjan, for another awesome webinar. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We will see you on the next one. Have a great day. Thank you.